Hi everyone. Welcome to the Department of English. I am Herim Huang, an assistant professor in our department. So in the morning, I will talk about you know, some linguistic concepts. And in the afternoon, we have another taster lecture in literature as well by Collier Nogus. So I think it'll be very fun and informative as well. So you're always welcome to come and join the afternoon lecture as well. So let me begin. So um, I do applied linguistics, especially, you know, focusing on English. So I will begin with talking about some linguistic concepts first. So when we, you know, say applied linguistics, what does it mean? So some people say it's a branch of linguistics that applies linguistic knowledge or, you know, for the solution of different practical tasks. So that is basically a problem solving task. We have some clear questions to be addressed and to answer those questions, we make use of some linguistic theories and concepts. That is applied linguistics, right? So to understand this area, I think it will be helpful to know some core concepts in linguistics first. So we can actually dissect language into smaller concepts, right? So when I say, you know, some language, it can be, you know, talked about at the level of sound, right? I'm sure that you will detect some foreign accents in my English, for example. So my native language is Korean. And when I say some vowels, Sometimes it's very, very hard. So for example, in English, the insect ant or the fruit apple, you have that as sound in these words, right? But when I say the chicken egg, right? E-G-G, -G, that as sound is a little bit different, right? In careful speech, I think I can distinguish these two sounds. But in my native, native language in Korean, we do not have this distinction. So it's sometimes hard to tell what is what, okay? So that's the sound level language. How speech sounds combine and how speech sounds are pronounced. Okay, so let me show you some interesting video clip. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We are sinking. What are you thinking about? So did you get it? So in German, actually the thinking, you know, you know, some conceptual thinking in your mind that TH pronunciation does not have a difference from S-I-N-G, sinking, the boat is sinking. So S and Th are not distinguishable in German. So actually this advertisement captures that phenomenon. Okay. okay, now let's talk about language at the word level, right? When I say words, W-O-R-D-S, actually you can segment this word into two separate meaningful units which is word, right? That's the word. And another one is S, the plural S. So actually at the meaningful level, we have two units there. That's called actually morphology, the structure of words, right? And when you think about words, we know there are some polysemy, right? One word has lots of meanings. 
that's about semantics, some lexical meanings. So you can say, so let's say you ate some dim sum, right? You can say sometimes it's good, sometimes it's delicious, right? So good and delicious. They are quite similar in terms of the positivity in uh, taste. Now let's move on to language at the sentence level, right? Uh, in my experience, like I used to be a primary school teacher back in Korea, when I taught like questions, making questions in English, I often saw my students have difficulty in making questions, right? So I'm sorry, I don't know Cantonese, but in Mandarin Chinese, you can have like WH words anywhere, like right? You can say that, right? Can you say that? In Korean, we can say that too. So actually, shei is who, and it's actually in the end of the sentence. So you can put like that kind of question word everywhere in Mandarin Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. But in English, basically, no. In English, you need to put question word in the beginning of the sentence. Do you agree? Right? Who is that? Who is he? Some, you know, every time you need to put who in the beginning of the sentence. That's actually a difference between English on the one hand and Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese, Japanese, and Korean, and many other languages on the other hand. And actually, my job is thinking about why these learners have that kind of difficulty when learning English questions, right? That's about the sentence level. And now let's talk about a bigger domain, the, you know, the discourse, right? Uh, let's say when I say, oh, isn't it hot here? It's very hot, right? It can be a proposition to indicate a meaning that the temperature is low here. But sometimes somebody can answer to me, oh, Harim, is it hot? Do you want me to turn on the AC or do you want me to open the window? So that can actually uh, produce some effects, right? So that can happen in the discourse. So let me show you another video clip which shows the importance of the discourse context, the interaction or conversation context. Oh, you're back. Is this my car? State Farm knows that for every one of what? those moments, this is ridiculous. There's one of these. Is this my car? What? This is ridiculous. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. Shut up. Shut up. Ah! <laughs> That's why State Farm is there. What a day. With car insurance. See, so actually these two people, the woman and man, uh, said exactly the same thing, right? The same sentence in terms of structure, they use the same words, the same sentences, but the context was different, right? The discourse context was different. So the meaning of the sentence became different too, right? So these are the domains that we study in linguistics, okay? So we talked about the language at diverse levels, from sounds, word meaning, sentence, and discourse. Okay, so I think we are ready with some basic concepts in linguistics. So now let's turn back to applied linguistics. So here are the area which can put under the bigger domain of applied linguistics, okay? So again, in the Department of English, we have two units, applied English linguistics and another unit, literature, okay? So you, you will get some sense of literature in the afternoon. So today I will just talk about this linguistics first. So corpus linguistics is you make use of some big data. So corpus is basically the big language data set out there. And then you use this big data to analyze, for example, the overuse or underuse of some 
language phenomena in a second language, for example. And you have the language acquisition, right? I actually, this week, I had a meeting with one of my undergraduate students. And actually, he told me his learning experience is a little bit different. So he told me that, you know, at school, it was not fun to learn English, just roots, you know, skills and memorization and fill in the blank task that was not fun at all to him. But he actually started watching a YouTube video clip, right? And then he got lots of input from English native speakers and he got, he picked up his English from the YouTube video a lot. So do you think the input quality matters? Of course, right? It matters. That kind of thing is investigated in the field of language acquisition, okay? And language education, I think it's quite obvious, right? So I'm gonna skip that. Multilingualism. So for example, in Hong Kong, Singapore, like Hawaii, it's a multicultural and multilingual society, right? It's very interesting that, so I did my PhD in Hawaii in the United States. In the dormitory, if like, let's say the people from Hong Kong and the people people from uh, Singapore and the people from mainland China gathers for the dinner, right? I can actually hear sometimes Cantonese and sometimes Mandarin Chinese, sometimes English. So all these languages are mixed there, right? That kind of thing can be investigated in the field of multilingualism, okay? and natural language processing. So I'm gonna talk about that later on because that's my area. And psycholinguistics, that's how you process a language. It can be a native language, it can be a third language, a second language. So let's say, again, let me take an example from Mandarin Chinese. So my tones are a mess, so please understand that. So when I say, can, um, can, ta yu, yi, zi, right? E is one, zi is a counter classifier for something, right? Do you get that? Are you with me, right? So when I say can, ta yu, yi, zi, and then you are, let's say you are looking at the computer screen. On the left side, you see a pen, okay, the writing pen. On the right side, let's say you have a bottle of water, right? Even though I didn't say B, the pen, you will look at the pen, right? Do you agree with me? Maybe, yeah? So actually you are processing something even though you didn't get a pen yet. So that's called predictive processing you actually make prediction based on the language input that you got and you expect something. That's one question that can be answered in psycholinguistics, language processing, how you process a language in real time. And now social linguistics, I believe that, you know, like I think when I talk to British people, they say, beautiful, lovely, a lot. But American speakers do not do that. Not, you know, like lovely, for example, okay? So in social linguistics, you can talk about the difference between regions, gender, things like that. So that's social linguistics. And word English is, is like, you know, there are now a variety of Englishes, right? I believe Hong Kong English is one variety of English. Singaporean English is another variety of English, right? So there are actually, you know, lots of differences in this English. And we do not make a norm for British speakers or American speakers. We have now different norms. All the understandable and comprehensible Englishes are accepted in this world now. And there are many more. Okay, so now let me talk about what I do. So 
I actually do. My focus is actually at the intersection of language and computer science, right? So when you think about English, you tend to, you know, come up with some books and a language sounds dictionary, right? But I actually make use of computer science for my research as well. So linguistics here, I mean by, you know, linguistics is how people learn language and how people develop their language and how people process language. And computer science is I'm using just big data, using like programming skills to develop an application or software to analyze language data. So let me give you a basic sense of it. So what is natural language processing, which is one of the expertise that I have? That is one branch of artificial intelligence, AI. And its main aim is to enable machines to understand and produce a human language, right? So I believe that you guys use like a smartphone and maybe you have an experience in talking to Siri or Bixby, right? So that's one field of natural language processing. Based on language, you try to program something to communicate. So now let me come back to the language here for a bit. Language production is a complex process, right? Now, here in the front, I am saying something, right? This is speech production, and there is actually lots of burden on me. I need to plan some content using these slides. I need to encode my message using my second language English, and I need to pronounce something, right? And also, sometimes I need to monitor and revise what I said. So, you know, like this production process can be challenging, especially for second language learners. So we need to think about a good way to assess language production data, okay? Because I have only two or three minutes left, I'm gonna, you know, quickly introduce what I do just for your uh, reference, right? So let's compare these two essays. Learner A wrote, Title is very hard subject. I don't have the power. I think that is no impact my life. So I don't think that it is not important. Very important is our heart. It is a real mind person. We are together. That's learner A. And let's look at learner B. Korean schools have been known for a long time to use physical punishment on students. However, recently there have been controversies on whether this kind of punishment should be allowed. I'm not gonna read all of this, but let's try to compare essay uh, A and essay B. How many of you think uh, essay A is linguistically more complex? What about essay B? How many of you think essay B is more complex? Good, yeah, thank you for your responses. Actually, that's right. When I analyze these two essays in terms of vocabulary items, words, or the sentential complexity, essay B is more complex, okay? So I'm gonna give you a taste of how to analyze this complexity a little bit. So actually there are many types of constructions like this. I'm not gonna introduce each for you, but here I have 11 types of constructions at the sentence level. They are all different. And my main prediction is that if learners proficiency goes up, that means if learners second language develops, their diversity of constructions will increase. Do you agree? right? They will use more diverse sentence types, right? So what I did was just develop a tool 
to compute the diversity of constructions. That is basically the number of the constructions and like using this tool. And finally, I found that as proficiency goes up, right? So this is A1, the beginner level, and this is T1, the most advanced level. And you see the constructional diversity went up, right? So this is one of the things that we can learn from our department. So here for this field, we have these diverse professors who are experts in the field. And I hope that you can join our department you know, soon. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Comments, <laughs> suggestions. Uh, great. If you don't have any questions, uh, I would like to share some. Uh, let's give a big hand to <laughs> Professor Huang for that. Uh, please <laughs> take a seat. So I'll talk about something about the um, less academic. <laughs> we'll talk about the extracurricular activities that you'll you'll experience in our. Um, department. So, um, hi, I'm Ernest Yoon. I'm a research master student in this department. I've spent uh, my undergrad here in this department as well, the four years of undergrad. I would like to share with you some of my um, experience, particularly the ex extracurricular aspect. So, without further ado, this is the first activity that I would like to share with you is the Andrew Parkin Drama Cup, also known as the APC Drama Competition. So in this drama competition, you'll be um, you'll form different uh, teams of uh, drama teams. You'll gain hands-on theater experience. Okay, this is doing making weird. Okay. Okay, I don't. I think it's okay. I'll, I'll talk from here. Okay, so uh, where am I? So you form different teams amongst yourselves. You gain hands-on theater experience from the uh, from it. And as most people, you may be shy about performing on stage, but don't worry. Apart from being, you know, an actor, you can also get um, to experience, for example, costume design, script writing, or director. And these are really valuable experiences because you don't actually get a lot of uh, opportunities to write for stage production and and rest assured you don't need any prior theater knowledge or experience to do that when i was in year one i was kind of um, forced <laughs> to become one of the actors but i end up really liking it and enjoying it and now i'm talking <laughs> about abc so it's a really nice um, experience for me and it's uh, easily one of the most important events in the entire English department. And this is a photo of my group winning. <laughs> so that's why I included this. And this is also another photo of um, the drama uh, performance. Uh, next activity would be the singing contest. Uh, it's an awesome event where you can exhibit your musical talents to your friends and classmates. Uh, meanwhile, not having to show it to uh, everyone in the university. So it's like a small cozy event, as well as a nice way to share talents. And um, you'll get a taste of performing and supporting your friends. It's a totally like, chill and happy function that, uh, and everybody just has fun. And I'm also including this because I won in, <laughs> in this same contest. And apart from this, like really, uh, showy and uh, performative events. There are also other activities that are more formal or more literary. Um, before the pandemic, there used to be high table dinners where you can spend the evening in a formal setting, um, dining with your friends and uh, perhaps enjoying music. We used to be able to invite uh, Sereni because she's one of our alumni. And We'll see about the pandemic situation. And there's also uh, poetry reading and reading circles. So if you are more of a literary person uh, like me. And so for 
if you are entering into a program, the first thing you'll join would be OTEMP. And, and it's a crucial experience where you'll most likely meet your first and best friends in universities and university. Um, my best friends that I knew are from OCAM, my group mates, and even my seniors, they are still besties with their OCAM group mates after like a decade. So it's a really valuable experience for us. And so in year one, you'll play and <laughs> take part in OCAM. And in year two, you'll be able to organize this event for the future, uh, for future year one uh, freshman students. So you'll be in charge of organizing the whole uh, four, four day, three night event. You'll um, uh, help organize, coordinate everything. You'll get again, hands-on approach on uh, organizational skills, which are really good with your perhaps uh, career prospect. You'll gain um, communication skills and you'll make a lot of friends. Uh, because and you're holding and scripting all of the events in that four day journey. And I'm speaking from a first hand experience because I was the president of the OCAM when I was in year two. And now it kind of shaped me into this me that I am able to speak in front of <laughs> so many people here. And so perhaps you're thinking that I'm a bad student <laughs> because I'm always joining this, these different um, events and not studying, but I actually studied. <laughs> so apart from, you know, frolicking and participating in various activities, I also developed my interest in poetry and romanticism. Uh, one uh, wonderful thing about our activity is that it doesn't require you to, you know, discard all academic responsibilities. Um, I managed to join like uh, perhaps 80% of the events, but still um, make time for my studies and maintaining a reasonably good academic result. I graduated with uh, first class honors and I got into the uh, research master's program and I'm tutoring introduction to literature this year as well. So that's uh, not too bad. <laughs> um, so the most amazing thing in our department is that you can pick anything you like, just like uh, you can do linguistics, you can do literature and then Activities wise, you can choose to have different um, activities. So perhaps Roxanne will talk about the curricular academic aspect of it. So even though she did not participate <laughs> these at all, we managed to be good friends. And it'd be, this is the most wonderful thing. We're in different circles, but we're all in this family, like a, uh, in a warm and welcoming, accepting uh, community. And that's what I treasure the most in this department. So. Um, with that, uh, this is the end of my sharing. Thank you. I'll have Roxanne here to, yes. Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to CHK. Time is really tight, so I'm gonna be speaking a bit faster than usual. And nice to meet you all. So same as Ernest, I'm a research postgraduate student at the department and I did my BA in English here as well. I graduated a year ago and I'm very happy to be here to be here to actually share some fun highlights of my undergraduate studies here. But as Ernest has mentioned, I, I was not very involved in the extracurricular activities at the department. It was not because they're not fun. You can tell they're very fun <laughs> by Ernest sharing, but merely because I have like other commitments to do so. So my sharing is probably not as excited, but <laughs> yeah, that would do. <laughs> so I joined the orientation camp as a freshman. It was a fantastic event. It was a lot of fun and I met a lot of like a bunch of nice people. As for the APC, the drama cup, I remember I actually quit it after the first or second meeting because <laughs> as you can probably tell, I'm not a very drama person. And even the idea of being on stage just really stretched me out. And what I'm going to tell you is that it's actually perfectly okay. And this is, I think one of the very precious things here. So we have loads of activities for you to participate in, but you have your liberty to choose what to do and what not to do here. So nobody's gonna force you to do anything that you do not like. And I didn't feel like any less welcome by the, by the people at the department. I still felt very much belongs to here at CHA English. 
And by the way, we do have like really fun study tours for undergraduate students. So mine was unfortunately canceled because of the COVID outbreak, but I reckon it's a very fascinating program. So do check it out on our department website if you're interested. And since that is the academic counseling sections, it seems I'm legit to talk more about academic things. So speaking from my experience, I believe that CHA English is one of the places that you can receive some very fine education in English language and literature. And I'm more interested in literary studies. So if you're interested in this, in this field, we can go and have a talk later. So I only did all the compulsory courses in applied English linguistic. And I'm not particularly good, but I'm yeah, doing okay. And I believe all these compulsory courses already adequately equipped me with a linguistic lens to examine language and society. And it's a really interesting one. And I took more courses of English literary studies and we do have a lot of options here. We can choose to study like canonical Western literature like Shakespeare or Milton or world literature or Hong Kong literature or adaptations or even like popular culture. I once took a course on superheroes, Marvel and graphic novels and it was a very interesting course and allowed you to see things a bit more differently. So probably from a more critical point of view here. And it, we even have a stream in creative writing. And the points that we're trying to make here is that we do have a lot of options here to focus on like linguistic or literature or both, what courses to take. And we do have a very large degree of flexibility and freedom to explore the very wide world of English language and literature. So at least for my case, I believe that the extensive training in language and literature have provided me with a unique perspective to see and unsee the world. And I believe that I've actually said it in, in many occasions that I'm truly grateful for all the things I've learned here and all the amazing people like teachers, tutors and classmates that I have met throughout my undergraduate studies. So this is like my personal reflections of my undergraduate studies here. And I do not want to bury you with a lot of factual things because our department website probably do a better job at this. So I'm going to end my sharing with a little promotions here. So if you have a passion in English language and literature, so this is probably the place that you want to be. So thank you very much. Bye everyone. Yay.